There is a reason marriage was a vow. You do not get to leave, period. Whenever a hiccup occurs in the relationship, maybe don't call it out at each hiccup, you know, because you have to have a certain amount of silent tolerance in any relationship to let small infractions go. But if they repeat, my rule is three times. Mm. And it's the rule that we, I share with my wife. If something happens three times that is causing emotional upset, anger, jealousy, disappointment, resentment, frustration, any of those things, anything that you don't want to experience and that you especially don't want to experience repeatedly, then you can call it out. And, and if, you, if you have three examples, your case is much better made than if you just have one. And I would also say that when you call it out, you know, you could say, look, uh, we were at a party the other night and I felt as if you were paying too much intense intent attention to um, Dave. Mm -hmm. There was some flirting going on there. I, that made me uncomfortable. Well, you don't say, well, you were flirting. Stop doing it. You say, this is what it looked like to me. And here was my response. And then you want to think, and maybe I'm a damn fool and blind and jealous and stupid. And I'm misinterpreting, or maybe it was a harmless flirtation of the sort that people will engage in because it adds a little bit of spice to a social interaction. You want to find out. Like it, it's really convenient if it's the other. You've got to think about this over the long run. You're going to be interacting with this person on a minute by minute basis for decades. If you're the idiot and that's causing trouble, then you should find out. So you want to say, well, look, this is what I saw. What's your explanation of what's going on? And then they'll offer you their viewpoint and hopefully they'll do the same thing. They'll think, well, this is my intent and maybe they have to go think about it, but this is my intent and this is what I saw. And I think you're being oversensitive and you peel back the explanations layer by layer until you both agree on what happened and more importantly, on what you're going to do about it in the future. And that's really hard. And especially if there is something going on that's not straight. That will require quite a bit of digging. It'll probably result in anger and tears and a fight. That's very unpleasant. It's, it's easier in the short term to avoid that. But hopefully the consequence of that is you don't have to have that fight again. Pay attention to your own uncomfortable negative emotions in order to manage that and not pretend that everything's all right or that you're nicer than you are or that you're less jealous than you are or less blind or you want someone in a relationship that you can spar with. And it's partly because you have hard problems to solve. And if the person that you're with isn't willing to put forward their opinion, then you only have half the cognitive power that you would otherwise have. Hopefully you find someone who's interestingly different from you, like not so different that you can't communicate and you have to be careful of that, but interestingly different and then hopefully they have the ability and the will to express their opinion, then your interest stays heightened and there has to be that tension in a relationship. You know, people think, I, I want to get along perfectly with my partner. It's like, no, you, you probably don't. You just get bored and then you go looking for trouble. And so you want a little bit of trouble in the relationship and a little bit of mystery and a little bit of combativeness and, and the ability to exchange opinions forthrightly. And, and I trust her, which is a huge element. I mean, when, when we finally did decide to get together permanently, we were both in our later 20s. And one of the things that I had learned by that point and insisted to her about was that we had to tell each other the truth. And she took to that wholeheartedly, you know, and um, for better and for worse, because truths can be harsh. Well, you want someone that you can trust, you want someone that you can build a view of the future with, and you want someone that you can negotiate with. You have to make time for each other. And you know, if you're dating, um, when you're establishing a relationship, well, you put some effort into it, decide that you're going to go out for dinner and you dress up to some degree and you know, you try to present yourself to each other in some mutually acceptable manner. And you hope that there's going to be a positive consequence of that, that you're going to find each other attractive. But then people think that once they're married, that the same amount of effort isn't necessary and that's wrong. 
I would say more effort is necessary on the same front. And, and you have to think it through if you don't want to be bitter about the intimate element of your relationship. How much time do you have to spend together each week? And my rule of thumb, sort of derived from clinical observations, is that you need to spend 90 minutes a week with your partner talking. That means you're telling each other about your life and staying in touch, you know, so that you each know what the other is up to. And you're discussing what needs to be done to keep the household running smoothly. And you're laying out some mutually acceptable vision of how the next week or the next months are going to go together, right? So that, that keeps your narratives locked together like the strands in a rope. You need that for 90 minutes or you drift apart. You need to spend intimate time together at least once a week and probably more like twice. And that has to be negotiated. And if you don't negotiate it, and if you don't make it a priority, then it won't happen. Well, then you don't have it. And that's a catastrophe because there's not that many things in life that are intrinsically, what would you say, engaging and meaningful and pleasurable and also bonding, all of that. And if you let that go, then Part of you dies and part of the relationship dies and well then there's always the possibility of becoming attracted by alternative entanglements which which you would do if you had any spirit left so if your relationship at home is entirely unsatisfying sexually what are you supposed to do with that nothing are you supposed to just bear it in one way the answer is yes because it's your marriage but another way is well what that's all the fight you've got in you you're going to just let the erotic element of your life die and, and accept everything that goes along with that because you're not willing to cause a bit of trouble to ensure that it's maintained. And, you know, and we're not very good at thinking these things through consciously. People are bad at negotiating, period, as far as I can tell. They're particularly bad at negotiating things that are deeply private. How much do you want your partner to know about you anyways? It takes a lot of trust to have a real conversation about what you need and want. It means that your family will have continuity over decades. It means that the narrative of your life won't be fragmented and broken by divorce or sequential divorce. It means that your children can grow up and maybe have their children within a continuing family. It means that your children will be able to maintain relationships with the grandparents on both sides and the cousins. Like, it's a big deal to maintain that. There's huge advantages in it. It means that you'll have someone there when you're not well, and so will your partner. And it'll mean that you have someone to share all of the positive things of life with. So there's huge advantages to it. Why does it have to be a vow? Well, I don't think you can tell the truth to someone who can run away. Mm -hmm. Because if you tell the truth to someone, and they can run away, then they'll run away. Because <laughs> You're, you're a mess, man, and not not just because of your own inadequacies, but because human beings are so complicated.